Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a pineapple twisted tea. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking an amaretto sour, and we are continuing our New Jersey Crime Month with an episode on the strange murder of 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma. I wanted to say this is a very dense but fascinating case, so be prepared. Jeanette was born on August 3rd, 1956 in Jersey City, New Jersey to Salvatore and Florence De Palma. She was the seventh of eight children. The family eventually moved to Springfield, New Jersey and lived on Clearview Road in a hilly middle and upper class neighborhood. By all accounts, the De Palma family was very religious and attended church multiple times a week. Many also described them as quote-unquote weird and quote-unquote tough. It's claimed they didn't leave their house much and they did not speak to many neighbors. Officer Ed Kish recalled police being called to the De Palma residence on numerous occasions after hearing Salvatore and Florence fighting. However, when they arrived, Florence would not let them in and say that the problem was over. There are varying accounts of who Jeanette was as a person. Some say she was a devoted Christian who volunteered to her church, while others say her family dragged her to church. Many describe Jeanette as a promiscuous wild child that liked to party and hung out with the wrong crowd. Others say she was no wilder than any other teenager at the time and that stories about her have been exaggerated. Officer Kitsch also claimed that Jeanette was known to police, yet other officers dispute this. She was known to hitchhike, but would only accept rides from people she knew, and she was not known to have been a drug user other than occasionally smoking pot. On the morning of August 7th, 1972, Jeanette's parents told her that her cousin Lisa had been missing for some time after having run away. Hearing about this after the fact angered Jeanette. Later that morning, she called her best friend Gail to cancel their plans to hang out that afternoon with two teenage boys they had met at a local park because she had chores. Gail begged her to come, and Jeanette eventually gave in and said she'd hitchhike over. The rest of the day's events are widely disputed. Jeanette's sister, Cindy, has said that Jeanette asked her to come to Gail's where she was planning to meet her boyfriend, but she refused, a claim that Gail denies. According to authors Jesse Pollock and Mark Moran, quote, Jeanette allegedly told her parents she had a shift scheduled for that evening, end quote, after she hung out with Gail at her home in Berkeley Heights. Florence offered Jeanette a ride, but she refused and said she was going to walk three miles to the train station and then take the train to Gail's house. Jeanette never made it to Gail's. Though there is no concrete evidence, it's believed by many locals that at some point during the day, Jeanette went to the home of her friend Donna Blattis. The Blattis house was known as a party house where teenagers were always hanging out. The late Donna Blattis' husband has said that, quote, Jeanette was having a fight with her boyfriend and was looking for a ride somewhere, end quote. Donna, who was grounded, was not able to give her a ride, and Jeanette soon left. When Jeanette did not come home the next morning, her parents called the police and wanted to file a missing persons report, but were told Jeanette had to be missing for 24 hours. At least one officer claims that they came in to report Jeanette as a runaway and that they were quote unquote not cooperative. Six weeks went by with no signs of Jeanette. Her family searched New York City and talked to some of her friends, but had no luck. Around 11 a.m. on September 19th, the superintendent of a Springfield apartment complex called police to report a disembodied forearm found on her property. Patrol officer Donald Swartz responded to the call at first believing it was a prank since a group of teenagers who lived at the apartment were known to cause trouble. However, he soon realized it was actually a human forearm. The arm was carried by a dog to the apartment from the Hudai Quarry, a former crystal and gravel quarry now bisected by Interstate 78 and settled between the Baustural Golf Club and Wat Chung Reservation. 
The officer called for backup and one of the responding officers wondered if it could belong to Jeanette since she was the only runaway in town at the time. Law enforcement canvassed the area, including the nearby Hold who died query atop a secluded cliff known to locals as the devil's teeth overlooking the aberrant quarry swartz found a body wearing a blue t-shirt and tan pants the same outfit jeanette was last seen in the body was so badly decomposed that they could not tell if it was a man or woman through dental records detectives were able to identify the body as jeanette de palma the location where the body was discovered had a cliff on one side and a steep hill on the other it was so steep that many officers tripped and had issues climbing to the top of the hill to remove the body a fire truck was driven to the bottom of the cliff and the ladder was slowly extended until it reached the top, and Jeanette's body could be placed on it and brought down. Jeanette's body was so badly decomposed that an autopsy could not be performed, but an examination was complete. No cause of death has ever been determined, but it is believed that Jeanette was strangled as there were no signs of bone fractures, traumatic injuries, bullet wounds, or knife strikes to her body. There was no evidence of drug use and it is not possible to test for alcohol levels, but her body was found to have high levels of lead. However, this may have been due to lead in the soil where her body was found and nothing has been solidified. Following the examination, Jeanette's clothes were hung over an air conditioning unit at the Springfield Police Department to dry and rid the area of the smell it created. This unprofessional practice likely caused some level of cross-contamination and damage. Samples of Jeanette's clothes were sent to the federal government for further analysis. According to the FBI Crime Lab report on January 3, 1973, officials tested Jeanette's clothes, including her blouse, slacks, and underwear, as well as the soil from the scene, and compare them with hairs collected from her dresser drawer and on her body. The FBI's microscopic and chemical analysis found that there was no quote-unquote apparent foreign hairs found on Jeanette's clothes. There were, however, stains found in her underwear, bra, blouse, and slacks that were quote, too decomposed for conclusive blood and semen examinations, end quote, according to the crime lab report. According to the Union County Medical Examiner's report, Jeanette was found, quote, lying face down with a rock formation surrounding the body, end quote. Once again, details vary, but it is said that her body was surrounded by occult objects. One officer on the scene claimed that there was a cross made from sticks near her body and that stones were placed near Jeanette's head resembling a halo, and another said, quote, it looked like witchcraft, end quote. Yet another officer who was on the scene said there was nothing occult about it. Jeanette's cousin Lisa, who visited the site where Jeanette's body was found a few days later, said the area was marked by police tape and that were branches and twigs tied together to look like crosses. A local newspaper reported that there was photographic evidence of Jeanette's body inside what looked to be a coffin-shaped perimeter made up of logs and branches along with makeshift wooden crosses. Rumors spread and newspapers reported, based on information shared by law enforcement, that Jeanette's murder could have been part of a human sacrifice performed by a satanic cult or a black magic ritual performed by a coven of witches who operated in the Wachung Reservation, less than two miles away from where Jeanette was found. The Wachung Reservation is a large nature reserve that runs through several towns in Union County and is sacred Native American land. Even before Jeanette's death, it was rumored that occult activity took place in the reservation. According to the Daily Journal of Elizabeth's report, quote, a number of sacrifices involving dead animals were reported around the Wachung Reservation, end quote. Around the same time, Union County Park Police had found, quote, burning candles, a bowl of blood, and feathers and pigeons with their necks snapped, end quote, within the park. Some newspapers even interviewed witches and warlocks that lived in the area. 
These rumors were further perpetuated by the fact that Jeanette was found atop an area nicknamed the Devil's Teeth since it resembled an inverted skull, and also by James Tate, the pastor of the De Palma family's church, who told another local newspaper that the police brought a witch to the crime scene and that Jeanette was targeted because of her devout faith. Rumors that Jeanette practiced witchcraft also spread, a claim that Tate would later say he believed. The quote-unquote satanic nature of the murder created a panic in Union County, which was still recovering from the List family murders that had taken place less than a year before. Not long into the investigation, police received a tip about a homeless man named Red, who lived in the woods around 50 yards from where Jeanette's body was found. He had allegedly left his campsite not long after Jeanette had gone missing. When police researched Red's campsite, was completely abandoned along with all of his belongings. There was even a pot with food still in it that was found. Red was tracked down and ruled out as a suspect. He never returned to Springfield. Jeanette's case quickly lost traction, likely due to the inconclusive cause of death, inconsistent stories coming from her friends and family, and local news no longer covering the case. Because there were seemingly no answers as to who killed Jeanette, rumors spread as to what exactly happened. There have been allegations of a police cover-up that exists to this day. This particularly stems from accusations that the Springfield Police Department had either lost or destroyed the case file along with their displays of evasiveness. Police claimed that the file was lost due to flooding from Hurricane Floyd in 1999. However, a former cold case detective at the department has said the files have been missing since at least 1984 when he began working there. In relation, one weird New Jersey reader wrote in and said, quote, Satanism is just a smokescreen to take the minds and attention of the people off the truly guilty by creating a scare, or should I say scam, end quote. The magazine Weird New Jersey began researching Jeanette's case in the early 2000s and have received dozens of other letters from people who had grown up in the area and had information or thoughts on the murder. According to Weird New Jersey, quote, when the editors began their own investigation into Jeanette's unexplained death, they were immediately met with resistance from the local police, end quote. In their research, they also found, quote unquote, deliberately damaged microfilm archives from the weeks following the discovery of Jeanette's remains. In 2015, Mark Moran, co-editor of Weird New Jersey, and writer Jesse P. Pollock published Death on the Devil's Teeth, the strange murder that shocked suburban New Jersey. Together, they interviewed many of Jeanette's friends and family members, as well as officers who were involved in the case. In their research, they learned that even decades later, many people are still too scared to speak about the case. Pollock and Moran discuss several potential theories and suspects that could be responsible for Jeanette's murder. And the first that we're going to talk about is Mike A. At 6.30 a.m. the day after Jeanette went missing, Officer Ed Keish was on his way to a house alarm call and noticed a red Ford Falcon in the area directly below where Jeanette's body was discovered. This was odd to him. Just half an hour later on his way back, the vehicle was gone. Jeanette's sister Cindy has stated that a teenager named Mike, who drove an orange or red convertible, would pick her and Jeanette up hitchhiking. He was around 17 or 18 and went to the same high school as Jeanette. Mike had a crush on Jeanette, which was not reciprocated and made her uncomfortable. When asked by Pollock and Moran if she thought Mike could have killed Jeanette, Cindy said yes. She went on to call his behavior, quote unquote, predatory. In 2003, a Weird New Jersey reader and former Springfield resident named Rose McNaughton wrote into the magazine about a teenage boy named Mike A that fits Cindy's description. Rose said that Mike called himself a warlock and practiced witchcraft. 
He liked Jeanette, and his family moved away not long after Jeanette's body was recovered. It is important to note that Mike's father also died around the same time, which could have led to a sudden move. She went on to say that he lived not far from Jeanette and was just a six-minute walk from where Jeanette was last seen. Rose said that she also took rides from Mike when hitchhiking and that for decades she thought he was responsible for Jeanette's death. A friend of Jeanette's, mentioned by Rose, claimed that Mike was known to be aggressive with girls at the high school and that he had been accused of sexual assault. Mike A. died in 2010 at the age of 56. The Union County Prosecutor's Office was notified of Rose's letter, but at the time of death on the Devil's Teeth being published, no one had reached out to her. The next person we'll talk about is Otto Nilsson. Otto Nilsson was a divorced father of five who worked as an accountant and lived in the South Orange, New Jersey area. On July 7, 1974, Nilsson was arrested for assaulting an old neighbor after breaking into his home. Police noticed how similar he looked to the sketch of the man whose vehicle, 24-year-old murder victim Joan Kramer, was last seen getting in in August 1972. Police then began an investigation. Nilsson was charged with assault and ordered to undergo a 15-day psychiatric evaluation. Just a few days after his release, teenagers Marianne Pryor and Lorraine Kelly went missing and were later found brutally murdered. For years prior, neighbors wondered if Nilsson was responsible for the murder of Joan Kramer and 17-year-old Carol Ann Farino. All three murders have several similarities to Jeanette's, including strangulation as the cause of death as well as proximity to where Jeanette was found. In addition, all five girls were Caucasian between the ages of 16 to 24 and had long straight brown hair worn with a middle part, which was the style at the time. We'll talk about all of these cases more in depth later in the episode. One neighbor claimed Nilsson had mentioned Carol Ann's murder before it was even reported by the newspapers. Another neighbor close to the Nilsson family said that Nilsson's son, Neil, told her, quote, unquote, I think my dad killed someone. Nilsson was arrested for Joan Kramer's murder in January 1975, and his trial began that summer. During the trial, eyewitnesses confirmed seeing Kramer get into a dark green or Buick at the time. Nilsson drove a green 1964 four-door Buick, but he traded the car in three months after Joan and Jeanette's disappearances. Strangely, the night before Jeanette's body was found, her cousin Lisa had a vision of Jeanette being picked up by a clean-cut man in a green Buick. Nilsson was ultimately found not guilty. In a post-trial interview, he told a reporter that he was living in Jersey City at the time of Jones' murder. However, it's been claimed that he was actually living with his mother in Union at the time, which would put him closer to Springfield and Jeanette's home. Further, Jeanette's friend Gail told Pollock and Moran, quote, where Jeanette's body was found is on the opposite side of the way you would take to get to my house, end quote. That led Pollock and Moran to realize that if the person who picked up Jeanette was planning to take her to Union, they may have passed the who died quarry. In 1976, Nilsson was arrested after holding two doctors hostage at gunpoint at a veteran's hospital. Two doctors testified that Nilsson was, quote unquote, suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. In 1977, he was sentenced to be committed to a psychiatric hospital in Trenton. Years later, Jeanette's sister was living in Hillsborough, New Jersey with her three children. Her daughter Rachel told Pollock and Moran that in 1984, a dark haired man with a gun came to their apartment and asked her questions about who was living there. Her mother ordered her back into the apartment and the man fled after attempting to get inside. She worked with a police artist, but nothing came of it. In 2013, Pollock and Moran showed her two of Nilsson's mugshots, and Rachel said, quote, that definitely looks like the guy with the gun, end quote. Though Nilsson would have been committed at the time, the authors found his criminal record, which mentioned a charge of escape. Nilsson died in March 1992, and his cause of death is not known. 
The last person we'll talk about is serial killer Richard Cottingham. In the spring of 2021, convicted serial killer Richard Cottingham and journalist Jesse P. Pollock began corresponding via email. In his emails, Cottingham hinted at him having potentially abducted and killed Jeanette while she was hitchhiking. Pollock forwarded this correspondence to the Union County Prosecutor's Office after Cottingham agreed to speak with investigators if they would meet with him under specific circumstances. Cottingham's statements regarding Jeanette's murder were later printed in the 2022 updated and revised edition of Death on the Devil's Teeth. Law enforcement and a journalist that have worked with Cottingham said he was not known to confess to murders he did not commit in order to just receive attention. Cottingham, who was active in New York and New Jersey, claims to have killed between 85 and 100 young women before he was caught. However, only 17 have been identified and confirmed. Cottingham was active between 1967 and 1980 and was known to take trophies from his victims. He also told Pollock that he was active in Union County at the time of Jeanette's murder. Many of Cottingham's murders were incredibly brutal, with victims' heads and hands being removed from their bodies. However, some of his murders were similar to how Jeanette was found. At the time of our recording, no updates have been given by law enforcement. Another popular theory is that Jeanette overdosed and died at a party. This party either took place at the Bladdis house on the evening of August 9th and her body was taken to the Devil's Teeth, or that she was partying in the area of the Devil's Teeth and she was left there by the rest of the party goers out of fear. Like we mentioned, the Bladdis house was known as a party house and friends were always hanging out there. And there are some accounts of Jeanette being last seen there. Donna, Jeanette's friend, had two brothers, Richard and Mark, who many suspect were involved in Jeanette's death. Jeanette's sisters, Cindy and Darlene, have said that their mother always thought the Bladdises were involved and that their suspicions grew when they did not attend Jeanette's funeral. Officer Kish feels the Bladdis theory is quote-unquote the most rooted in truth and that the Bladdis family had connections to police and politicians which helped protect them. It's important to note that with this theory, some officers dispute the claims that Jeanette was carried to the spot where her body was found, calling it quote-unquote nearly impossible due to its steepness. And it's also worth noting that the Devil's Teeth was not known as a party spot. If Jeanette did not overdose, some believe she could have been killed by a group of individuals involved with drugs. Officer Schwert told MyCentralJersey.com that, quote, police knew that some of the kids who hung around with Jeanette were drug addicts, end quote. This is supported by Edward Salzano, a former private investigator and friend of Jeanette's nephew who lives in Springfield. He said, quote, there was a really bad group of people here in town. There was some evil stuff going on and there was a lot of people getting caught up in it and LSD was basically introduced for the first time, end quote. While he doesn't think Jeanette was doing drugs, he did go on to say, quote, there was just a series of unfortunate events and she got mixed in with the wrong people and they killed her, end quote. Finally, police were known to use an area in the Hudai Quarry as a makeshift shooting range. Some wondered if Jeanette was hit and killed by a stray bullet and the police covered this up. However, Officer Kish claimed that the shooting range was in the opposite direction of where Jeanette was found and again her remains had no signs of any bullet wounds. In the 1980s, Jeanette's family hired a private investigator who was not able to find anything and concluded there was a cover-up. In 2019, Salzano unsuccessfully sued the Union County Prosecutor's Office with hopes of getting the agency to test Jeanette's clothing for DNA. In the lawsuit, Salzano claimed he met with the Union County Prosecutor's Office to discuss Jeanette's case and deliver documents that he said Jeanette's nephew, John Bainsey, a close friend, gave him before he died. His lawsuit states, quote, I asked if Jeanette's clothes would be DNA tested and I was told no, end quote. Salzano and a partner run the Justice for Jeanette group in the hopes of raising awareness and eventually getting her clothes tested. In February 2021, Jesse Pollock received a copy of a majority of Jeanette's case file after submitting a request under the New Jersey Open Public Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act in 2019, proving once and for all that the case file did exist. 
Upon viewing the case file and photographs, the Weird New Jersey team concluded in a 2022 update that there was, quote, no occult activity involved in Jeanette's death, end quote. The alleged, quote unquote, halo of stone and crosses made of twigs were not in crime scene photos. There was also no, quote unquote, animal sacrifices near the body, which had been a longtime rumor amongst locals and no altar. They said, quote, the closest object resembling a cross found near the remains were are two rotten tree branches that had obviously fallen in that spot a long time before Jeanette had come to rest there, end quote. The photo also revealed that the contents of Jeanette's purse had been dumped near her body, but that her purse was not actually found by police and possibly stolen by her killer, along with her missing gold cross necklace. Crime scene photos also reveal that the area where Jeanette was found was overgrown with bushes and other plants. There was no evidence of any gathering mentioned in the reports. No one was ever charged in connection with her death, and no new leads have ever been publicly reported in over 50 years. So what do you think about the murder of Jeanette Palma and the aftermath? It's obviously a very sad case and one, like you stated at the beginning, that has so much information. I'm definitely not surprised that it took a dedicated team of journalists to parse through all the different information that's involved in this case. I think that the police are showing a very high level of incompetency in this case. And I think that they're trying to cover themselves. Even if they're not actually covering for someone, they clearly made mistakes in this case that they don't want to be fully revealed, which likely or allegedly adds to the fact that this case has been unsolved, despite seemingly having a lot of suspects attached to it and ones that you can view as fairly credible, at least credible enough to warrant a thorough investigation from police officers. While I think the work of the Weird New Jersey team is definitely great and commendable, you definitely need the police helping with any investigations because they are the ones that ultimately are going to be responsible for making sure that the person is arrested and that the case is then sent to the prosecutor's office. So the fact that they seem very hands-off with the investigation and the fact that they can't even get their story straight about whether there is a case file, whether it's missing, DNA testing, not really giving a real answer as to why comprehensive DNA testing can't take place now when that's something that has been fairly standard in cold cases. Going back and seeing what new technologies can be used to aid in investigating and finding the culprit is definitely strange. I think when looking at all the possibilities, I think I lean towards the serial killer, Cottingham, doing it. Uh, The fact that it lines up with when he was active, the fact that it lines up with how he left victims, I think it definitely fits. And one of the most compelling pieces for me It's the fact that he was not known to just confess to murders. You know, we hear a lot where people just confess to things uh, for attention, and that's not something that he would do. So the fact that he did confess to the uh, murder of Jeanette De Palma is definitely something that kind of raises a flag for me and says that we likely know who did it. It's just a point of actually having the evidence to prove it, which is very unlikely due to how the police handled this case. What are your thoughts? I agree. I think you're spot on. There was, in my opinion, definitely a cover up, but I don't know exactly why. And Del, like you said, I lean towards the police trying to cover up some type of mistake that they made. Or I don't know, maybe they thought someone that they knew or were close to was involved, but it doesn't really seem like they were covering up exactly for one person. I am very suspicious of Mike A and Nilsson. I think everybody makes sense, but I think as of this moment, I'm also leaning towards Cottingham for the exact same reasons. So one of the, I don't know if it was the journalist that was working with Cottingham, but they said that he was very embarrassed by the fact that he got caught. 
So that's why he wasn't flaunting, hey, I killed this girl and I killed that girl and all these people that he didn't actually kill. He said he was really embarrassed because his family doesn't talk to him anymore because he was convicted of these crimes and that he got caught, like I said, and that he had to stand trial, which I think makes sense. And you can read some of what Cottingham said in our Weird New Jersey link. And that will also have the crime scene pictures that were released. Um, Jeanette's body is like, I guess they said compassionately redacted from these pictures. So you won't see her body, but there is like a, a cutout in these photos of where her body was. So if anyone's interested, you can get a better idea. It's so frustrating that we have so many unanswered questions and it's hard to even know who the police like investigated or talked to because it doesn't sound like this Mike A guy was investigated. I don't think the police were directly involved with her murder and that's what caused the cover up. But honestly, I feel like at this point, anything is possible and I do agree um, with Weird New Jersey saying that I don't think anything occult happened. And like that one letter said, I think it was used as a distraction. One officer interviewed for the book said that the occult thing was said to the media by, I think, another police department after like an interdepartment meeting. And there are lots of mentions, I think, by this officer in the book, The Death on the Devil's Teeth, which I highly recommend, about rumors being started by other police officers in the area in retaliation for things. So if that's where this occult aspect stems from, that's really frustrating and incredibly unprofessional because I think that's kind of like I mean, I Jeanette's case has really been buried. There is not much information you can find like outside of the Weird New Jersey resources. And I think like the occult aspect is like what really sticks out for people. That's what kept locals talking about it for so long. But if that's not even true, that's really annoying, like I said, to see. And the fact that there is really no information out there also leads me to believe that it was a cover up. There are so many questions and it's so frustrating. It's strange too that like, why wasn't the case file released sooner? Because people had put in plenty of requests and I know you can't just like give it out to anybody, but I don't know because of that other people can't now be interviewed. And I think that the weird New Jersey team has really done more for this case than the police probably ever have, or maybe ever will. Like we said, we don't really have like any updates on them looking into Cottingham, not to say that they're not doing it, but it's been over a year. And Jesse Pollock has made it known that this man is not in good health. So he needs to be talked to sooner rather than later. So it's just very frustrating. Pollock mentions in the book, like some people really feel like this case is going to be solved soon, but then other people don't. And I don't know where I stand. It might be one of those cases where we all kind of know who did it. We just don't have like an arrest for that. I can see that happening with this case. Like we said, it's theorized that Jeanette's murder was related to the murders of several other young women in New Jersey. The first that we'll look at is Carol Ann Farino. On November 3rd, 1966, 17-year-old Carol Ann Farino left her shift at a local diner in the early evening and never made it back to her house. She was found strangled with her own pair of pantyhose in a driveway just a mile from her family's Maplewood, New Jersey home. Her body was still warm when it was discovered by a neighbor. Similar to Jeanette, her purse and shoes were missing and she was found across the street from a golf course. Over the course of 50 plus years, the police followed hundreds of leads, interviewed dozens of friends and family, and tried to determine who killed Carol Ann to no avail. In 2021, journalist Joseph Strupp published the book A Long Walk Home, a young woman's unsolved murder and her sister's lifelong search for answers. He worked alongside Carol Ann's little sister, Cynthia. Cynthia told the Asbury Park Press, quote, The thing that motivated me was that finally somebody was interested. Every time I tried to do something to raise public awareness, it was swept under the rug. Nobody wanted to hear about it, especially in Maplewood. There was this attitude that Maplewood is sacred and we can't shed any negative light on it. End quote. Even in more modern times, as Strupp was researching the case, he faced resistance. 
Strupp said, quote, the Essex County Prosecutor's Office sent me a five-page rambling citation of statutes and laws that they claimed protected them from having to provide information after an Open Records Act request was sent, end quote. He also said that, quote, no DNA samples from Carol's clothing or personal items found with her have ever been tested or run through the New Jersey DNA database, end quote. The identity of Carol Ann's killer is still unknown, though some believe Otto Nilsson is the perpetrator. The next case is that of Joan Kramer. 24-year-old Joan Kramer, a doctoral student at Columbia University, went missing on August 15, 1972, eight days after Jeanette disappeared. Joan had left a dinner party at her parents' home in South Orange, New Jersey, after having a fight with her fiancé. She walked about a mile to the center of the South Orange Business District and then called a girlfriend about midnight to tell her about the fight. Her friend told her to get a taxi to take her home. Joan then called her parents and, for an unknown reason, told them she was in the nearby city of Newark. Witnesses would go on to report that Joan then went up to an automobile stopped at a traffic light on the corner of South Orange Ave and Sloan Street. She asked the male driver for a ride. She did not return home. Joan's parents reported her missing and her disappearance made headlines. Two days later, a man with an accent called the Kramer residence claiming to be holding Joan hostage and asking for a $20,000 ransom. Mr. Kramer left the ransom in designated areas on two separate occasions, but the caller could not find the funds. The man was determined to be a fraud. Then on August 28th, Joan's body was found in a secluded area of a park in Union, New Jersey, just seven miles from her parents' house and only six miles from where Jeanette's body would later be found. Her body was nude and laying face down in a water-filled ditch. She had been there for at least a week to 10 days. It was determined that Joan had been manually strangled by a right-handed person and that she had been killed less than two hours after eating dinner, making it most likely that the person who picked up Joan also murdered her. Joan's clothing was found nearby, but just like Jeanette, her necklace and shoes were missing. A pickaxe was also found, and it was later determined that it had been used to try and bury her clothing. The Union County Prosecutor's Office set up a tip line dedicated to both Joan and Jeanette's cases, but no useful information came from it. Several other men with criminal records were suspected of Joan's murder, but like we said in January 1975, Otto Nilsson was arrested and charged with her murder. Nilsson was found not guilty in July of that year. During their research, Pollock and Moran were told by the Essex County Prosecutor's Office that the trial records, along with records pertaining to Joan's homicide and the discovery of her body, were quote-unquote presumed lost or destroyed. It's not known if prosecutors were familiar with the similar murders of the other aforementioned young women. Joan's murder has never been solved, but Essex County Prosecutor James Lordy thinks the right person was put on trial and personally considers the case closed. The final two victims we're going to look at is Marianne Pryor and Lorraine Kelly. On August 9, 1974, 17-year-old Marianne Pryor and her friend, 16-year-old Lorraine Kelly, took a bus to the Garden State Plaza Mall in Paramus. The girls did not return home, which was unlike them. They were last seen by Lorraine's boyfriend, who dropped them off at the bus stop and watched them board. Police insisted to both families that the girls were runaways. Marianne's sister, Nancy, stated, quote, The police really had nothing to go on, so they kept saying hitchhiking, end quote. She continued, quote, It made it look like the police were doing something. I can only speak for my sister. She was afraid to hitchhike. My sister was cautious. I don't think they were hitchhiking. It never set right with me, end quote. 
This was made worse when a waitress came forward claimed to have seen the girls eating at her place of employment. The North Virgin Police Department then made a statement announcing the girls as runaways and saying, quote, there is no longer any reason to fear the girls are victims of foul play, end quote. The very next day, a woman was in the parking lot of her apartment complex in Mount Valley, New Jersey, when she saw the nude bodies of two young women lying face down. A rope was loosely tied around the neck of each body, and there was a, quote, glass soft drink bottle inserted into each of their vaginal cavities, end quote. Police were immediately called. Law enforcement noticed a, quote, lack of blood on and around the bodies, end quote, which then led them to theorize that the girls were killed elsewhere and carefully placed by the apartment complex. On the girls' wrists and ankles were marks that they had likely been tied up before being killed. In addition to being found without their clothes, their shoes and purses were also missing. However, each girl was found with jewelry. Before law enforcement could notify Lorraine and Marianne's family for identification, they sadly heard the news of two bodies being found on the radio. The two victims were positively ID'd as Marianne and Lorraine in the community rallied to support their families. It was determined that both girls died from suffocation. Lorraine was killed six hours before Marianne, and they had been dead for up to 40 hours before being found, which led police to believe that they were stored somewhere before being dumped. This was furthered by the fact that no one at the apartment complex had seen the bodies until the morning of August 14th. Investigators searched multiple locations believed to be the murder site, but had no luck. When asked what she believed happened to the girls, Nancy said, quote, My theory is someone came along that Lorraine knew from her brother or sister, and she said, It's okay, I know this person, and they offered them a ride, and reluctantly, and reluctantly my sister went along, end quote. Richard Cunningham was eventually convicted of both the murders on April 27, 2021. In court, Cunningham admitted to kidnapping the girls, then tying them up and raping them both in a motel room. He killed them by drowning them in a bathtub. Again, Carol Ann, Jeanette, Joan, Marianne, and Lorraine had several similarities in their appearance. They were Caucasian, had long, straight, shoulder-length brown hair parted in the middle, they were of average height and were all thin. The similarities continue into the manner of the crimes and crime scenes. Many, if not all, were known to hitchhike. All were killed by obstruction to the airway. All were found dead arranged face down and all but Carol Ann were found in a wooded area. All had something taken as a souvenir and their bodies were all left out and not buried or concealed. Pollock pointed out that the local police departments at the time were not well coordinated with one another, so murders even in neighboring towns might not be recognized as related. In their research, Pollock and Moran discovered that during the time Otto Nilsson was committed, they could not find any solved or unsolved homicides in New Jersey that even resembled the murders of the five women. So we know that Marianne and Lorraine were killed by Richard Cunningham. But Del, do you think any of these are related to Jeanette or each other? And who do you feel is responsible? I think that all of the murders were committed by Richard Cunningham. I think that they are too similar to think that a different person did it, especially when there's no evidence that a lot of information was shared and that it could be a copycat situation. So I find it strange that they're holding him accountable for two of them and not all of them, but it could just be the murkiness that comes with the other cases as to why he hasn't been officially indicted and convicted for the other murders. But I definitely do think they're related. I mean, we listed all those similarities. Even if cases had half the number of similarities, we would strongly suggest that they related to one another. I think that one of the things that really uh, sticks out for me is the souvenir part. 
we know that that's definitely something that many serial killers do. They take a souvenir. And that's also something that was found in all of these cases. I think that Nilsson may have committed some crimes. I'm not saying that he's a completely innocent individual, but I don't know if he's responsible for the crimes that we described. What are your thoughts? I think Nilsson did kill Joan Kramer. I don't know about Carol Ann. It does seem pretty similar to, at the very least, Joan's. But hers, I think, sticks out in a different way than the other girls. I mean, she was murdered walking home from her job. And it seems like a pretty residential area. And she was left on somebody's driveway. So that, I don't know, that's like very opportunistic. And I mean, the other ones were opportunistic too, but it seems like there was acceptance of a ride most likely in these situations. So yes, it was opportunistic, but there was, I guess, like a little more buildup and like setting the scene almost. So I'm not sure. I do think they're related to an extent. Now, I don't know who, which ones are exactly related to each other, I will say. I think Jeanette is either related to Joan Kramer's murder or Marianne and Lorraine. Like you said, there's so many little coincidences that make it seem like that. And this is like not necessarily like a large area geographically. So to have like two active serial killers in this small area is probably like statistically unlikely, but who knows? It seems like Cottingham is probably responsible for Jeanette's murder. And like we said, he was convicted of Lorraine and Marianne's. But I think there's enough to show that um, Nilsson did definitely kill Joan Kramer. I wish we knew more about Jeanette's because then we could know for sure if someone saw her getting into a car, what kind of color was the car? What did the person look like? Did that match a description of Cottingham or... Nilsson, again, same with Carol Ann. If maybe someone saw her leave, was somebody following her? Did she walk by? Did someone see a car following her? I don't know. There's so many questions and stuff we'll probably never have answers to. And I just want to add that the interesting thing about these cases is that had the police really done their jobs, and specifically with the forensics, we would likely have an answer to whether these cases were connected to each other, how many were connected to each other, because we would be able to compare the DNA, not just to a perpetrator, but to each other's cases. And unfortunately, we don't have that very crucial piece of evidence. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's just like extreme incompetence. And I do want to say too, in at least three of these cases, I don't know as much about Carol Ann. Well, I don't know. I actually never mind. In all of these murders, someone has suspected a police cover up, which I think is really interesting. We see Carol Ann's sister talking about there was a lot of resistance and that the prosecutor's office doesn't want to give the journalist information. We see with Joan how her case files were also lost and There is a lot of information even about each of these little cases. So I really, again, recommend reading The Devil's Teeth because within Otto Nilsson's trial for the murder of Joan Kramer, there is an alleged crooked cop that lied on the stand, which helped Nilsson get acquitted. So that's something to think about. I didn't want to include it just for like sake of time. That's something to think about. Jeanette, like we said, a lot of people think there was a cover-up. And for years, Nancy Marianne's sister believed there was a potential cover-up because she said Lorraine, I think, worked for the county and knew a lot of people, including the mayor. So I think it kind of shows like the state of possibly trust people had in the police in that area at the time and just like the state of things. I know, again, within the death on the devil's teeth, they mentioned briefly how in Springfield, the town council couldn't get a lot of stuff done because of a lot of infighting within like the old school residents and the the new residents of the town and how that affected things like the police department. So 
could that indirectly have led to all this weirdness and a a cover up with Jeanette's death? I don't know. Maybe. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the murder of Jeanette De Palma. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.